us beyond the divine where God's children shall rest eternal there will ever abide daily striving to reach that homeland we are going that way headed for glory telling the story we shall see heaven someday 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 we shall see Jesus someday by and by Shouting and singing, joy bells ringing, we shall see heaven someday. Like the saints who have gone before us, we're determined to stay in the path that is straight and narrow, leading us forward each day. Though we have problems, Jesus is faithful, all our needs will supply. The time is now nearing, for is appearing, for our heavenly flight. Someday, someday we shall see Jesus, someday by and by. Someday, someday these eyes shall behold him in that city on high. We must not linger, we must keep moving. Is leading the way, shouting and singing, joy bells ringing. We shall see heaven someday. Shouting and singing, joy bells ringing. We shall see heaven someday. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. Let's all stand and we'll just turn to page number 380. 380 in your hymnal, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steep across the waves onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves Jesus saves wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saves Jesus saves tell to sinners far and wide Jesus saves Jesus saves sing ye islands of the sea Echo back the ocean caves, her shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom When the heart for mercy craves Sing in triumph for the tomb Jesus saves, Jesus saves Give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves <laughs> Let the nations now rejoice Jesus save, Jesus save, shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory, Jesus save, Jesus save. I feel like you're just getting into singing this morning, let's sing that last verse again. Just like you did it, sing it out on the fourth. Give the winds a mighty voice. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus 
saves, Jesus saves. Amen. 805, because he lives. Page 805. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, and empty My Savior lives Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives All fear is gone Because I know And life is worth a living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still The calm assurance This child can face Uncertain days Because he lives Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives Fear is gone because I know He holds a future and life is worth a living just because He lives. And then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's fight, no war with it. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know He reigns because Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future, and life is worth a living just because he lives. Just the courts a cappella. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know <coughs> he holds a future. And life is worth a living just because he lives. We're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy this morning. Page nine in your hymn book. Page nine. Let's sing it out this morning. We still serve a God who is holy. 
He is holy. And because he is holy, I believe his people ought to try to do their best to be like him. So the Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what God told the people. And I know we'll never attain to his level of perfection and purity, but it sure is a good mark to aim for. It really is. I still think God is pleased by a people that are separated unto him. I still believe that. Let's sing this song to him. Think, sing it from your heart this morning. This is the God you serve. You're singing about him. So sing it from your heart. Holy, holy, holy. Sing it like it's the last song we'll get to sing together. All right? Lift your voices good and loud together. Holy, holy, holy. We're good. It's good singing this morning about through my phone at your brother Ashby. Hope you're ready to catch it. If you're watching from home this morning, hope you'll send me a quick text message. Just tell me that you're watching and where you're watching from. It's always an encouragement to me to read all the people that are watching after the services. I enjoy going through those text messages. So if you are watching from home, now the, the emphasis on that statement is from home. If you're in the pews this morning, don't send me the text message, all right? Every week, someone tries to be funny and says, watching from the fourth pew or from the third pew or whatever. If you're at home this morning, send me a quick text. Let me know you're watching, and I would sure appreciate that. Let me make a few announcements right now before we go any further just to get them all out of the way. Um, a brother Dowdy has a new job, and with a new job came a new cell phone. So if you have a number saved in your phone for Brother Matt Dowdy, then you need to not call that number anymore. They're giving that cell phone to somebody else, and you'll be uh, harassing someone else uh, when they get that phone. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if you don't have his number already, I'm not going to give it to you now because we're live streaming, but you can come see Brother Dowdy. And uh, if he wants you to have that number, he'll give that number to you. And um, if you ask real nicely, so make sure you do that. And then 
event in the foyer. There's a couple of sign-up sheets I need you to get by and look at. Number one is the sign-up for the nursery this week. Uh, we have our Bible conference going on this week, and we need a little help in there. Just need a couple ladies to work in the nursery each night, and it's Monday through uh, uh, Thursday. I think we already have Wednesday taken care of, but there's still some openings on those other nights. So if you haven't already gotten by there and signed up for that, <clears throat> would you please do so? And it'd be a help and, and a blessing. We don't, want, we don't want one person working every night. We want them to be able to get in and enjoy the services. And so if you would please help us with that, I would appreciate it. And then Miss um, Desiree Lamar graduated high school this year, and um, her open house will be here at the church on the 24th. There's a sign-up sheet back there in the foyer. Please go by and sign up, and then plan on coming by and celebrating her graduation with her here at the church. I think it's at 5 p.m. on the 24th, and so make sure you're a part of that, okay? And then uh, the, the 8 to 12-year-old class this morning for junior church will stay right in the auditorium. So in a few minutes when the choir is dismissed and all the other kids are going downstairs, y'all are going to stay right in here this morning. That's the older age, older age of junior church. You're going to be up here this morning, and uh, we're looking forward to having Brother Steve preach to us. It's been a, been a couple of years, three years, I think, since you've been here to preach, and uh, we have missed you. I enjoyed the fellowship last night. I've missed that so much, and we're looking forward to what the Lord will do, uh, do this week through the Bible conference. How many of you got a bulletin when you came in? How many of you got a, got a bulletin? In that bulletin, I, I did something this week that I, I don't normally do for Bible conference. But I put the schedule in the, in the bulletin and the, the topics. The, the, the theme this year is Precious Treasures. And the speakers are going to be Brother Steve Williamson. He's preaching for us all day today. And then he'll be preaching two times this week during the Bible conference. And so he'll be, he'll be one of the preachers, Brother Tim Crotts from Bear Trail Baptist Church in, um, in uh, Virginia. He's going to be one of the speakers, Brother Andrew Ray from Knoxville, Tennessee. He's coming in. And then, of course, Brother David Brown. Everyone knows Brother Brown. Him and his family are coming in. They'll be the speakers. And uh, the topics this week, I'm excited about them. It's going to be a good, good meeting. The, uh, we, we took these... Took these uh, it's gonna, normally when I have a preacher come in, I just tell him to pray about what to preach. I don't tell him, I don't give him an assignment normally. Brother Steve has prayed about this morning and this evening. I don't know what he's preaching. I didn't tell him. But for the Bible conference, we try to stay focused and, and kind of hone in on a, on a passage or on a, on a theme. And uh, this year's theme is, is the Precious Treasures. And there's several things in our Bible that the Bible calls precious Several things, and if God calls them precious, I think we ought to take note of them. And so uh, the topics this week, uh, Brother Ray will be preaching on the precious Word of God, and then we'll hear about the precious cornerstone, and then we'll hear about the precious thoughts of God, and then the precious promises of God, and then the precious trial of your faith, and the precious death of the saints, and the precious blood of Christ, and the precious redemption of the soul. Those are all things the Bible calls precious, and I am excited to hear how these men will unfold those, those thoughts from the Word of God. If you've never been a part of the Bible conference, you've got to be here. I'm telling you, you'll leave this week encouraged. You'll feel like something has been accomplished in the Word of God. It'll be a great, great meeting, all right? So the services start at 6.30, <clears throat> each night. And um, we're going to try to have the choir sing a couple of those nights. And so, choir, please try to be here. We'll have you sing bef between the first and second preacher each evening. And so it'll probably be around 720, maybe 725. And so just plan on being here uh, for all of that, okay? If you have questions about any of that, you can see me after the service, and I'll try my best to answer those questions for you, all right? Brother Luke Leonard, why don't you come and ask the Lord's help and blessing on the service this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. Lord, we thank you that once again we can be in your house this morning. Lord, I pray that uh, you be with Brother Williamson this morning as he brings the message. Lord, that you'd fill him with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you'd speak to each and every one of us here. Lord, as we open your word throughout the week and uh, look at what you find precious in your word, Lord, that it would speak to hearts. Lord, I just pray that you bless the service, have your hand upon it, and uh, speak to each of us from your word this morning. We pray in your name. Amen.
Let's stand. We'll sing page number 426, Dwelling in Beulah Land, on the second verse. Turn around and greet someone this morning. Page 426. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth being set on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from Gilead land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in Beulah Turn around and greet someone this morning.
on the last. Viewing here the works of God, I sing in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the Spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Just the chorus. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. For I am dwelling in Gulaland. You may be seated this morning. Ushers, come on with those offering plates. We'll go ahead and get our offering right now. We will take an offering up at the end of the service for Brother Steve Williamson and his family. And so you, uh, if you want to give towards him, then we will take up another offering. If I don't forget, y'all realize I had my dad preach Wednesday night, and I totally forgot to take up an offering for my own dad. I had, and you know I heard about it later for sure. Um, anyway. To make matters worse, somebody in the church tracked us down after the service. My dad wanted to buy my kids some ice cream, so he took us to uh, Twisters in, in uh, Chelsea. We were standing there waiting, and, and one of the church people sped up in their car, jumped out, and put money in my dad's hand. It talked about making me feel bad. It's like, I forgot the offering. They didn't. They remembered, but anyway. And then they handed me a piece of broccoli. I'm not making that up. Miss Laraway had a piece of broccoli in her car to give the pastor. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. I'd have rather had the cash, to be honest with you, but, but whatever. All right. We've got a big week ahead of us, church. I, I, can't, make out, I, I can't make enough of it. It's going to be a, a great week. I hope you'll plan on hope you're planning on being here for just every night that you possibly can. Me and Brother James, and we get excited about this week. I love expository preaching. I love it. Hey, listen, I'm not condemning uh, topical preaching. I'm not. But let me ask you a question. Since God gave us his word, the vast majority of the New Testament in letter form, don't you think it just makes sense that God would intend his word to be taught and preached in an expository style? Doesn't, doesn't it, wouldn't it be offensive to you if you wrote your wife a love letter and she read one sentence of it and folded it up and put it away? But wouldn't, wouldn't that be kind of be like, come on, honey, I put a lot of time into that. Uh, but, um, but we do that with the word of God. We, would, we open it, we grab one little sentence and try to make so much of the one sentence forgetting the larger context. Well, Bible conference isn't that way. We, uh, we preach the context of the passage, and it's going to be a great, great week. I'll tell, tell you what it'll do if, you, if you've never been to a Bible conference. I'll tell you what it'll do. It'll help you know how to study the Bible. But, but as you listen to these men give their outlines, and, and, and you'll be able to follow the, their train of thought and how they studied the scriptures out, it'll help you know how to, how to better study the Word of God. It really will. It, I get something from it every single time. So, so anyway, that's, uh, that's this week, starting tomorrow night, okay? Now, Tuesday, in your bulletin, Tuesday morning, the prayer meeting is still in that bulletin. But as of this morning, just a little bit before the service, my schedule has changed, and I will not be able to be here for that Tuesday morning prayer meeting. All right, so you're going to have to make a mental note that there is no Tuesday morning prayer meeting, even though it's in your bulletin. All right, normally, normally we meet at 7 o'clock, and uh, I, I won't be able to be here for that. So there is no Tuesday morning prayer meeting this week. If you understand that, say amen. amen. All right, then please don't call me at 7 o'clock Tuesday morning saying, we're outside the church, we can't get in. All right, there is no Tuesday morning prayer meeting this week. All right, well, let's bow our heads together and we'll ask the Lord's blessing on the service. Father, we're so grateful for the way you've blessed us. You've been so good to us. And Lord, I pray now that you would bless this offering. 
God, would you find it pleasing in your sight, Lord, not just in the amount that's given, but Lord, the motive behind the giving. Would you find us to be cheerful givers this morning? We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Musicians, thank you for your help this morning. Miss Susan Carlson uh, uh, just happened to be in town today. Miss Laura is it not feeling well, and so she filled it on the piano. We're so thankful for that, and uh, the people are thankful for that. If it was not you, it would have been me. So they are very thankful for you playing, I promise. And it's. Well, Steve, I'm trying to remember the last time I got done playing something and they clapped for me. I don't remember that day. I, I don't remember that day at all. Well, this is Brother Steve Williamson, and Brother Steve just made my day. He came up here. He said one of the young people in the church walked up to him this morning and shook his hand and said, oh, you must be Pastor Summer's father. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> Makes my day. Makes my day. I was laying in bed last night trying to figure out how many years you've been coming up here. I think this is the 12th year, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, you turned 50 this year, right? So that means he was, he was a year younger than I am right now, the first time he came up. And we were in much better shape 12 years ago. We, we, had a, we played softball with, the, with all the kids. We had a big softball game. We, we play all kinds of stuff. I've watched Brother Steve wrestling with our young people. And we're not doing much of that anymore. We're not. I was laughing. How many pairs of glasses you got on you? He's got two pairs of glasses on him. And I was laughing. Took about to eat last night. And uh, me and, and uh, a couple of my boys, my dad and Brother Steve. And I looked over. Brother Steve's got his cell phone out with the flashlight turned on to the menu, trying to read the menu without glasses. And I think we're getting older. I tell you what tells me we're getting older, Brother Steve, is, is your kids. They are grown. The first time they came up, Scott was just a... a just a little guy, must have been 10 years old, 11 years old, maybe, I don't know. And now he's married, and um, it's just an incredible, incredible family they've got. We, we love Brother Steve, but we really love his family. That's, I mean, we started having him come up, not for his preaching, but for their singing. That's why we wanted them to come up. And uh, we're just stuck with his preaching this morning. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that is what it is. All right. Brother Steve, after that wonderful introduction, why don't you come and uh, preach the Word of God to us? Yeah, I love you. Thank you. I love you, too. All right, praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Kill us. <laughs> Amen. I'm still trying to get over the fact I'm old enough to be your daddy. Amen. I'm <laughs> Thank you, sister, sitting on the front row. I think it was you, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> Wanted to know, was I Pastor Summer's father? Well, it made me feel really good this morning. Amen. I do want it. Well, Many of you have asked me if my family was here when I said, no, you were disappointed, but they do send their love. My wife said hello to all of you, especially you ladies. So good to see so many familiar faces. Thank God you're still in church. Thank God you're still in the same church. Amen. And it's good to see new faces and new growth in the church. I love your ministry. Pray for your ministry. Love your pastor. Love his family and his children and, and how God has used them here and been a dear friend uh, of mine. Brother Adam, you have a special place in my heart, brother, you and your wife and your kids. 
And I thank God for this ministry. We pray for it daily. Uh, you're one of the churches and preachers I pray for daily. So thank God for you. I'm thankful for the good prophet's chamber that you have. And not only that, every time I come, I look forward to the goodie bag. Man, y'all do a good job. I just can't wait to tear into it. And, it's, uh, and I see that other people, when they leave the prophet's chamber, looks like they leave the goodies behind in a basket. I'm taking mine home, okay? It will not be left behind. It had my name on it. And uh, so I'm taking it with me. And I'm looking forward, trying to bring my family with me back to your October fellowship. By the grace of God, we'll do our best to be here. Looking forward to that. And the conference this week, before we get into the message, the conference this week, what a great theme, Pastor Summers, and uh, looking at all the things going to be preached. And as you sent that to me, I thought, man, that's a great series to preach just as a pastor. And so I thought, man, I will, I will take that and preach that as a series to my people. But they found out your church website and they'll be watching the conference this week. And so I'll not be able to take that back home and preach it. So anyway, take your Bibles to the book of Psalms this morning. Psalms chapter 16. If you'll look at with me there in the book of Psalms chapter 16. Preach a message this morning that uh, really be applicable to all of our lives. And we want to look at this text of scripture. And then we want to go to a, another portion of scripture that will see this truth developed we can kind of look at the scripture to see a window that would expound to us this Bible truth that it could be practical and, and applicable in all of our lives. The book of Psalms chapter 16, the entirety of the Psalm verses one through 11, it is a messianic Psalm in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ about the Lord himself and the person of Christ. But I'm interested really in verse five through verse eight of this Psalm and try to apply it and make it applicable to our lives. Look at verse five with me this morning. The Bible says, the Lord is the portion of, of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel my reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I'm really interested though we will in an expository way expound uh, the context of these verses to you, try to unfold them before we move on. But I'm really interested to get the thought, the title of the message will be out of verse six, where it says, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. I wanna preach this morning on the thought, the benefits of living within the lines. The benefit of living within the lines. You would understand this morning that everything in our life is defined by lines, everything. Every aspect of life, as you look around in this building this morning, all of you are sitting in lines. Everything when it comes to construction is in lines. When I was even flying on the airplane at 10,000 feet, I was looking as I was coming across different states and even into De Detroit and all of the neighborhoods, everything is in symmetrical lines, the architects, because lines bring order. Lines remove confusion. Lines give clarity to things. As we think about the context of the scripture this morning, uh, as you drove to church this morning, I wanna to say to you, thank God for lines in the roads, right? The lines are for your safety, they're for your protection, they give, they give direction, they give guidance. And so I'm thankful for the lines that are on the roads this morning that kept you safe. Could you imagine driving uh, to church this morning and there be no lines at all defining which lane you're in? It'd be pretty dangerous, wouldn't it? Be very dangerous. So as we think about the lines, everything that you write on paper is written by lines. The sports that you play define lines. I would not want to play a game of sports. I played baseball and football my entire life. I would not want to play a sport where there were no lines defining when you score or when you're outside of bounds or lines that define where you're at. Could you imagine the arguing that there was? There's enough arguing when there are lines, right? 
I mean, man, they're, they're, you play a volleyball game. Uh, man, I mean, you can take 10 minutes out of a volleyball game deciding whether or not the ball hit the line, inside the line, outside the line. Could you imagine if there were no lines? Now see, that's how Satan wants to, you to live your life. He wants you to live your life without lines because broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Broad is the way many there be that go in there at. This world hates defining lines. They hate things that define right and wrong. Things, the world wants gray areas. You know what the Bible does? It removes the gray areas for us. God gives us lines in the scripture. And so as we talk about that this morning, the psalmist said in verse five, the Lord is my portion. As he begins to describe this, a portion is something that's been allotted to you. That thing that is given to you by God, a part of an estate maybe that goes to an heir that you inherit. And here's what the psalmist said, the Lord himself is my portion. Do we view God that way as being our portion? And then he said, not only that, the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. I'm reminded that the psalmist said that that the Lord uh, fills my cup, my cup runneth over. The cup deals with the fact of you being thirsty and having a thirst for something. And the Lord is a portion of my cup. I wonder how thirsty we are this morning for the Lord himself. And the thirst, does he satisfy your thirst? The Bible tells us that, that Jesus Christ is that living water. And the Bible says that he is that living fountain in the book of Revelation that we should drink of. He satisfies the longing soul and the thirst that is in the, the, the heart of man to be satisfied. Jesus Christ is the portion of not only my inheritance, but also of my cup. And then outside of that, the Bible says this, thou maintainest my lot. As we talk about this portion of scripture before we see it developed in a Old Testament story, the fact that maintainest my lot, your lot this morning, what is your lot? People will say that's your lot in life. Your lot deals with your fate, the things that seem to happen in your life that the world would say it happens by chance. It's just by chance this is my lot and I'm just having to deal with this bad lot that is dealt to me. But yet a lot is something that the world says is by chance, it's your fate, it's your future. But I wanna tell you that your lot is by divine determination. Your lot in your life is by the providential hand of God. And the psalmist said, because the Lord is my portion, the Lord is my inheritance, the Lord is a portion of my cup, and because I have made the Lord that in my life, the Lord maintains my lot. Here's what he's saying. I put my life in his hands. I give my life into the hands of God. I have committed my life into his hand and he maintains my lot. You know what the word maintain means? The word maintains means that God holds your life in his hands. He keeps you. He, he has a grip on you. He holds you fast. He will not let you go nor surrender you. Listen, it will be a great day in your life, dear child of God, when you commit your life into the Lord's hands. Isn't that what we desire from our young people? If they'll just give their entire life to God and let God maintain their lot. If they would just give their life to the Lord and not live their life their way, but if they will lose their life in Christ, they will find it. And so the psalmist is talking about the Lord maintaining his lot. And then he goes on in the text, he says that also, yea, uh, as he deals with verse six, the lines are fallen unto me. Think about this now, the lines are fallen. So these lines cause the psalmist here to end up in pleasant places. Fallen unto me does not mean just by trip and an accident fall. The word fall in the text, if you look it up, means to be handed down or descended to you. He said the lines have caused pleasant places handed down by God because I've committed my life to the Lord. The Lord maintains my lot, my future, my every day. And because my life is in his hands and I've made him my portion. And because of that, God has put some lines in my life that I live by. And because of that, my life has ended up in pleasant places. The lines, if you'll live your life within the lines, it will lead you into pleasant places. 
It won't happen by accident. It will be by design. It has fallen down to you from the hand of God. As we think about lines this morning, uh, before we go on, I know how it is in a parking lot. There's lines in a parking lot. And how many of y'all get upset when somebody doesn't park within the lines? Anybody in here besides me? Man, I mean, you're trying to pull in and park and you can't park because somebody's crooked inside the parking place or they have parked across the line in the parking place and you're real upset about it. Anybody else like that? And you walk in and say, man, they don't even know how to park. They can't even park within the lines. See, lines bring order. Now, lines also, let me say this, lines will define what side you're on. Lines always define where you stand. We judge people by lines. We don't like any, anybody to break in line. Y'all like people to break in line, even in a church fellowship. When you're waiting in line and somebody else steps in line, boy, people can lose their spirituality real quick. Grace goes out the window. They step in line and you look at the person next to you like this and they look back and you're like, You ever been fishing with somebody and they threw their line across your line? Oh, man. Anyway, let's get off that, right? We'll move on. Lines, there's much that we can say about the lines. But I want to look at this thing about pleasant places. The lines cause your life to end up in pleasant places. Now, the world, the world sees lines. They see them as bondage. Can I tell you, lines are not bondage. They are blessings. Lines are blessings. The world sees lines as almost a prison, but they're not a prison, they're for your preservation. The world will look at lines as being suffocating because of the rules that lines lay down. And can I say that they're not suffocating, they are for your safety. Dear child of God, dear young person, lines are for your safety. Let me say that, when mom and dad lays down rules and when maybe the preacher lays down rules and the word of God is gonna lay down some rules and some commandments in your life, they're not there to be bondage to you. They're there to bless your life. They're to keep you safe and out of trouble. They're there to protect you so that you don't have regret. And here's what David said. He said, oh my goodness, the lines that God has given me has fallen unto me in pleasant places. Let's look at that this morning. Look at Isaiah chapter 28. Let me show you a verse here in Isaiah chapter 28 before we move on. Isaiah chapter 28, look at verse nine. Isaiah chapter 28, nine, the Bible says, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, Isaiah 28, nine and drawn from the breast. Look at verse 10. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Will you read these next statements with me? Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. You know what the Bible is talking about precept upon precept? A precept is a commandment or a mandate that is put down in writing. A precept is a commandment that is intended as an authoritative rule of action. In other words, the 10 commandments in your Bible are precepts. And then the Bible talks about precept upon precept, then line upon line. You know what the Bible's talking about line upon line? It's talking about itself, the scripture. Your Bible is written line upon line, here a little, there a little. The truths that we find from the scripture that define the way we're supposed to live is not all found in one passage. It is found as you read the Bible line upon line, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept. And so the psalmist, as you, if you would study Psalm 119, and through the Psalms, as David talked about meditating on the word of God, meditating on the law of God, loving the Lord's law, having a passion for the Lord's law, meditating on it day and night. And because he talks about that, he talks about how he desires the commandments of God. They have given him understanding. They have making him wise, even wiser than his teachers. You wanna know why? Because he spent a lot of time inside the lines of that Old Testament, reading God's laws, reading his commandments. And so Isaiah is talking to us here about the scripture being line upon line, here a little, there a little. 
that they might go and fall. And so I want you to, let me see here, uh, verse, verse 11. He says, with, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Look at verse 12. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. You know what he's saying is going to cause rest to the weary? Line upon line. Precept upon precept. You're so weary living your life in sin and in the world and living your life according to your own heart and your own lust and the ways of your own mind. I'm telling you, friend, it's gonna make you weary. You'll get weary in this old weary world. But I'll tell you what brings rest to the life of an individual is when they will live to decide to live their life within the lines of the Bible. You say this morning, you say, I've given my life to the Lord. You know what that means? To give your life to the Lord? To give your life to this book? To the ways of this book? The commandments of this book? The laws of this book? The precepts of this book? God does not give us anything in the Bible by a suggestion. He gives it to us by direct command. And so the psalmist is saying, I mean, excuse me, Isaiah is saying that it will cause to the weary rest And he says, and this is the refreshing. You know how refreshing it is to get your life in order? Have you ever felt like your life was in chaos? Let's take it away from the Bible. But just in business, have you ever felt like your life was in chaos and in order and you need to just put things in place? You know how refreshing it is when there's finally order in your life? When there's consistency in your life? You wanna know why sometimes you feel like your life is in chaos? Because there's not a spiritual consistency in your life. If you know anything about raising children, the greatest thing you can implement in your child's life from the time they're small is consistency. Consistently, they're in church on Sunday morning. Consistently, they're in church on Sunday night. Consistently, they're in church on Wednesday night. I probably said it many times, I would exaggerate with numbers, but I would say at least a thousand times in my ministry that I, there's nothing that, that would seem to cause my heart to ache more If one of my children through their life came up on Sunday and said, Dad, are we going to church today? The only reason they would ask that question is if we had not been going to church when we're supposed to. Consistency. That's why. That's why. Your little children, you know what they do? When you get done reading them a book, they'll turn back to the first page, say, read it again. I'm like, oh, dear God. It's all I can do the first time. Right? And they'll bring the same book over and over and over. It's familiar to them. It's consistent. See, the word of God will bring a refreshing in your life. It will bring a rest to your life. If Satan, I say to the young people this morning, if Satan makes you look at the Bible as nothing but legalism, if Satan will make you look at the Bible as nothing but just rules, nothing but just commandments, nothing but just things that God wants to implement on my life that takes all the fun out of my life. It takes all the enjoyment out of my life. I mean, if you live by the Bible, you can't have a good time. Hey friend, I'm having the time of my life living in the pages of that book. I have enjoyed the last 34 years of my life every single day because I have chosen to live my life God's way instead of my way. Oh, what a refreshing Line upon line, precept upon precept. And then look what he says. The word of God will be not only rest to you, but refreshing. Yet, here's the problem. They would not hear. Verse 13, talking about rebellion. Isn't there something, isn't there something that's in our nature? Rebellion, we're bent toward rebellion. We're bent toward rebellion. Say, what do you mean? If there's something put down that says don't cross a line, something of a, inside of us wants to cross. Have you ever been somewhere, have you ever, have you ever seen something that, that had a barrier and said, don't touch wet paint? <laughs> Am I the only one that's ever touched it to see if it was really wet, right? I saw this show one time, you know, it used to be things like Candid Cameron, different things like that where they'll put people in situations and have a hidden camera and nobody's around to see what they would do. And there was this one I saw one time, this museum that they had just, Scientists have built this massive dinosaur out of one fossil. You know how they do that? One bone and build the whole thing out of one leg bone. They know what the whole thing looked like. But they had this huge dinosaur. 
And then they had, they let you come right up to it and they had all this barrier around it said, do not touch. Do not touch was everywhere. But yet they put the barrier close enough you could reach out and touch it. And they would put people inside there. They would let them go in. And they would make sure that as a person went in that they would have people rush to the door and keep everybody away because they're filming them. And these people would look at it and they would stand around, they'd look around and they'd reach out and they would touch it. And as soon as they touched it, somebody was sitting in a room watching a camera, hit a button and the whole thing would collapse. <laughs> Do you know what happened when it collapsed? They didn't stand there going, it was me. They ran away and got in there like, I'm, I'm standing over here and I don't know what happened, the whole thing fell. They would say, where were you at? Did you, no, 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 I would never tell. It says, do not touch. And man, there were like a hundred people over and over touching it, touching. Something in our nature to rebel. We want to step over the line. But oh, the blessing. Oh, the blessing. If you would just make your mind up. See, we think living within the lines is not going to be enjoyable. The greatest joy you'll ever have because you'll live a life without regret. You'll live a life without baggage. You'll live a life, it is wonderful to lay your head on your pillow with a clean conscience at the end of the day. A clean conscience, not defiling your conscience, not violating your conscience, not stepping over your conscience. It is wonderful at the end of the day to bow your head and thank your God for the blessings of that day and not have to spend an hour weeping and confessing and grieving and saying, God, I am sorry. And see, so the Bible is telling us here in this passage of scripture that the word of God, I believe that David is speaking of the lines of the word of God that he has chosen to live by that has caused his life to end up in some very pleasant places. Very pleasant places. And so Isaiah chapter 28 again, if you'll look um, in verse 13, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward. Here's what happens if you don't live your life of course see they would not hear as the lines were preached to them they would not hear and you see what happens when you will not hear you will fall backward you will be broken you will be snared and you'll be taken that is the consequences of not living inside the lines that god has given us can i say again you will you will, it's just a matter of time you will fall backward it's not you might, it is you will fall backward. You will, it's not, it's not, well, you know, they did it and got away, you know, I, I'll probably do it and get away with it. No, you will be broken. You will be broken. You will be snared. You'll find yourself in a snare wondering how will I ever get out of this mess that I've ended up in. You'll be snared. You'll be taken. Just a few examples. Everything in our life defined by lines in other words, lines can be joyous or lines can be full of sorrow and grievous. In other words, when a woman is with child, if she takes a test and she's wanting to be with child and you're married, there's going to be some lines show up that you can rejoice over. It's going to define some things. These, you're looking for the lines, right? But oh, how sad it is when a young lady is snared because she didn't live according to these lines. And then when she saw those lines, it was not joyous. It was full of regret and tears. And how am I going to make it? And, and what am I going to do? How can I tell mom and dad? What is everybody going to think? See, lines. We have 12 men in our church right now that we house and we help. It's called Shepherd's Disciples, getting off drugs and, and alcohol. I've given a lot of drug tests. And you know how happy they are when you give them one and they pass and the right kind of line shows up? And then when a line shows up that's not supposed to be there, I can tell you the sorrow that comes with it. And see, there's gonna come a day that every one of us is gonna take our last breath. And if you're laying in a hospital bed, there's gonna be a flat line. If you are saved and took Christ as your savior, you're gonna end up in a pleasant place. A place called heaven. But if you did not submit to the lines of this book, when that line defines your life is over, you will not be in a pleasant place. For those who have rejected the gospel, there's a place called hell. 
a place called hell. I want you to look with me this morning as I just show you briefly. If you'll look to the book of Ruth, I'll not, for the sake of time, be able to read all the portions of Scripture. But I want to take just a moment in the book of Ruth and show you how this plays out in the book of Ruth, living within the lines. You understand, if you'll, if you'll get there, and I know some of you may, Joshua, Joshua Judges, Ruth, if you're looking right before the book of First and Second Samuel, if you'll get there. The book of Ruth. If you'll realize here in the book of Ruth that Elimelech has taken Naomi, his wife, and his two sons, Malon and Chilion, down to Moab. You know, they married, his sons married two women, Orpah and Ruth. This book is entitled by Ruth's name. Let me just give you something I just found out this week. I got to studying about Moab. Let me say this about being out of the will of God. There's different ways you can preach in a top, topical way the thought about them being in Moab. But I got to looking and I got to studying from Bethlehem, Judah, to enter the border of Moab is only 20 to 30 miles. How many of y'all have walked 20 miles in one day? Anybody? Very few. Any of you walked 20 miles in your life? <laughs> Here's my thought. Not only, you can, you, can walk, you can walk 30 miles in a day if you'll get with it. About 10 hours. But I want you to understand that if they were on horses and buggies, if they would have decided in that 10 year period being in Moab to just go back to Bethlehem, Judea, they were just one day from being back in the will of God. One day. You may be out of the will of God, but I'm telling you right, I don't care how far out of the will of God you are, right here today, in one day, you can get back in the will of God. If you just make your mind up, get back where you're supposed to be. One day, it doesn't take a year to get back in the will of God. You make your mind up to live according to what God said. And in one day, one service, you can get back in the will of God. Make your mind up to be in the will of God. So we can understand in this chapter, you know that, that her husband has died. Naomi's husband has died. Both of her sons have died. Three widows, widows are there. And she tries to send Orpah and Ruth back. Three times she tells them, go back. Go back to your father's house. Go back to your gods. Go back to the way you're living. Don't go with me. God's dealt bitterly with me. You know, after the second time, Orpah made her mind up. She kissed Naomi and she went back. But Ruth didn't do so, did she? Three times Ruth was told to go back. And do you realize what happens in verse 16? And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Some lines in her life, isn't she? And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Read this with me. And thy God, my God. You know what she did? She made her mind up. I'm not going back to my God's. I'm not going back to the way I was living. Chemosh was the abomination of the Moabites, the Bible says. And Ruth said, I can't go back to my gods. I, your God will be my God. Your people, my people. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfast minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Verse 22, she goes back with her mother-in-law. Naomi made her mind, as she made her mind up to go back to Bethlehem, Judea, she tried to send her daughter-in-laws back, but Ruth said, Ruth said, I'm going with you. Your God will be my God. Let me throw this in. Jewish historians I was studying, had no idea, but Jewish historians said this. This is interesting. This is not in your Bible. It's just Jewish historians of history. They said that Orpah went back and married a Philistine. And if you know anything about the lineage of Ruth, David's in the lineage of Ruth. And here's what they said by studying it. Now, this is the Jew, their history. They said, on that day that Saul had a battle on the field, Goliath, the champion, was the offspring of Orpah. And David is the offspring of Ruth that decided to stick with God. And it come down that their two offspring are on the battlefield. And I'm telling you, the one that decided to live for God became the victor. Came the victor. Oh, you may amount to much in the world to be a champion in the world's eyes, but it is no, it is a cheap substitute for walking in the ways of God. Cheap substitute. So here's what happens in the next chapter. I'm just gonna trust your mind and memory in the book of Ruth. 
Naomi sends Ruth out to go glean in fields. As she sends her out, just find a field, go out, find a field to glean in. Ruth just goes out, just trying to look for a field that looks like a good field to glean in. You know, the, 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 the harvest, those that harvest the gleaning, they go through and whatever's left over on the plants, and it's a time of barley being left over, anything that they missed, you can come through the field and you can glean and pick it off. The, and, and sometimes it's a lot of gleaning to try to glean anything. Well, here's what your Bible says in verse three. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Chapter two, verse three. And her, say that little three letter word, her what? Hap, it's the only time it's in your King James Bible. You know what the word hap means? It means to come upon by chance. It means by casual event, accidentally to come upon. And if you'll choose to live your life for God and make your mind up you're going to serve the Lord and make your mind up you're going to live within the pages of this Bible and walk in the will of God, there's going to be some things that happen in your life that may just seem to be chance. But I'm telling you, it's no accident. It is the absolute providential hand of God. If you have committed your life into the Lord's hands and let him be your portion, you'll find that he will maintain your life. How many times have things happened in your life that just seemed to be chance and you knew that only God could orchestrate such an event as that? Only God could have brought something like that to pass. And so Ruth is walking through and she sees a field. She doesn't know Boaz. She's heard about Boaz, but she does not know that's Boaz's field. And she just turns aside. I'm sure she is praying and looking where to glean. And she goes into the field of Boaz. It was just her hap, the Bible says as it seemed by chance, was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, which was the kindred of Elimelech. You'll find as she gleans in this field that Boaz comes home. He starts, he knows about her. He asks who the young lady is. The reapers tell him that this is Ruth. And then he speaks to Ruth kindly, tells her don't go to another field. He said, I've heard about you, how you've dealt with your mother-in-law, Naomi. And we know that my people know that thou art a virtuous woman and that you've come to trust under the shadows of the wings of the Almighty. You've made a decision to serve God. Now here she is. She's a Moabite. Understand who she is. She is a Moabite. Well, the Bible says, if you'll look in verse 15, that, and when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. Look at verse 16. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose to her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Did not say that the, did not the psalmist say that the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places? Do you realize what's happening here because she's made her mind up that she will serve God and not go back to her gods? That she will go to Bethlehem, Judea, where God is giving bread to his people and, and that she no longer is going to identify with the world, her people. She's going to identify with God's people. Because of that, here she is now gleaning in a field and Boaz says, look, let their fall, let their fall. See, that fall there is not by accident, it's by design, by providence. And here she is in a field and she's gleaning. See, earlier in the day she was gleaning and she was really having to look through the barley and glean. Now she goes back afterward and she's gleaning behind the reapers and as she does, she's looking and she's going, wow, these guys are really bad. Well, they're not doing a good job. I mean, I can't, I mean, he's paying that. Look how bad they are. But God is letting some purpose fall unto her because she's made her choice to live her life for God. She made her choice that God's people are gonna be her people, that she's gonna forsake her gods. And so now they're falling into her handfuls of purpose. You know the story. Boaz ends up redeeming her. And as Boaz ends up redeeming her, the Bible tells us, I don't have time to tell you all about that. I got about three, four minutes. I want to give you one portion of scripture. If you'll look with me in the book of, well, look at the end of the book of Ruth. I want to show you this. End of the book of Ruth. Look at verse 21. Verse 21. And Salmon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David. So Salmon is Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. 
Boaz is wealthy. Boaz has the blessings of God in his life. And we look at his father and his lineage. His lineage is Salmon. That's who his dad is. Look with me in Matthew chapter 1. Let's see who Salmon is real quick. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Go to the New Testament. Verse 5 and verse 6. Before we read verse 5 and 6, I want to read you verse 1. The Bible says, verse 1, the book of the generation of anybody there. Can you tell me the next two words? Jesus Christ. We're looking at the lineage of Jesus Christ. And in the lineage of Jesus Christ, verse 6, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab. You know who that is? That's Rahab the harlot in the Old Testament. Rahab. So Salmon is married to Rahab. And can I remind you about Rahab if we read the book of Joshua in two places? Remember the spies went into Jericho. Rahab spared the spies. She let them down by a cord. She began to tell them, I know who you're the fear and dread of y'all are upon us but I know who the Lord is and I'm asking you to spare my life my mom, my dad, spare everybody and you know what they said when they were letting, she let him down by a cord it was a scarlet cord but the Bible says it was a scarlet line in two places, it called it a line and they said here's a token we will be blameless we absolutely will spare your life when we come in and here's the token let the scarlet line hang in the window so when we're coming in and her house is on the walls of the city, when we come in, we'll know that that's your house. When she let them down by the line, if you read the book of Joshua, you know what the Bible says that, they, that she did? She, that moment when she let them down, she placed the line out her window that day. When they were walking around the walls of Jericho for seven days, you know what happened every time they passed? There was a significant scarlet line in the window. And they identified it. And when the walls fell, here's the miracle. When the walls fell, there's only one section of the wall standing. Rahab's house was on the town wall. She let him down the town wall. When all the walls fell down, God Almighty kept a promise because she let a line define her allegiance. And every, the entire walls fell down except one section and don't you think that day when she is inside the house and her mom and her dad and her sisters and brothers are all inside the house and there's an earthquake and the dust settles and they walk outside and they're the only house standing on the wall? Let me tell you, friend, the house of the righteous shall stand. The house of the wicked shall be destroyed, the Bible says. But here in this passage of scripture, we see the last, this last text that we're looking at in Matthew chapter one. The Bible tells us down in verse five that Salmon begot Boaz. So that means Rahab was Boaz's mama. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Do you know what we're looking at here? We're looking at the fact that Ruth is in the very lineage, which is line age, the line of ages. Ruth finds herself in the very lineage of Jesus Christ. She is there married, married here to Boaz and David comes through that line. Let me tell you something, as you are looking in the book of Ruth, if you were looking there, there is a book in your Bible that says Ruth. Because she chose to make God her God and live within the lines, she's living within the lines in a pleasant place for all eternity. In closing, and we're done. I say especially to you young people, don't look at this Bible as its bondage. This Bible will bless your life. Don't look at this Bible as constricting. It's not constricting, it's comforting. I promise you, if you, now this is not just for young people, but this is for every body of every age inside this church this morning. The psalmist said, the psalmist said, the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, that's, that, that is reinforcing the statement. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Some of your first generation Christians, and you've chosen to live within the lines, and if you'll walk within the lines of this Bible, your children are gonna have hope that in their life they'll live in pleasant places and never have to visit nor experience some of the places you've been. You know what the lines will do? 
keep you out of some of the places you ain't supposed to be. You know what happens when you live the Word of God? The Lord establishes your going. There's some places you won't go anymore. But you won't go. The lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. I'll leave you with this thought. There are benefits. There are absolute benefits for choosing to live your life within the lines. Yes, sir. Read it. Love it. Love it. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor Summers, I'm going to turn the altar call over to you, preacher. Let's stand together, please. The heads bowed and eyes closed. Brother Dowdy's going to lead us in a song in just a minute. The thought occurred to me as Brother Steve was preaching in my own life, looking back, I remember being a teenager sitting in service. I remember some of the messages that were preached. And it's true in my life that I've looked back and thought to myself, boy, if I had just made up my mind that day to live within the lines. I wonder what would be different in my life now. There are young people in this place, some of you teenagers, you don't have to live with those questions. You have the opportunity today to decide. The lines are there for my benefit. God has handed me these lines. I'm going to live within them. You have that opportunity today. You don't have to live for the next 30 years looking back saying, what would be different if I had just chosen that day? And then there's no doubt in a crowd this size, there's no doubt someone here, probably several people here today who would say, you know, I've heard the preacher preach today. And the reality is I've never turned to Jesus Christ to save my soul. Well, friend, today could be that day. Today. This could be the day that you stop living for yourself. You stop living according to what you think is right. But you turn to the the scriptures, allow the lines of scripture to dictate what's true and what's not. If you need to be saved today, what would keep you from it? Father, thank you for this message. Lord, thank you for the, the thoughts that have been shared with us. Lord, I thank you for the conviction. Now, Lord, I pray that you would take this invitation. Lord, what a, what a waste it would be to hear a message like this morning and then to just discard it and throw it away and remain unchanged. So, Lord, I pray that you'd keep that from happening in our hearts. Would you please do a work in the hearts of these people today? Well, thank you in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, there's people at the altar already. Maybe you ought to join them. Maybe you ought to join them. There's such a wonderful blessing that comes with living within the lines that God has given us. Hey, forget what the world says. Forget how how they feel about the lines. Why don't you just trust your heavenly father? Why don't you trust him? As Miss Susan plays something softly on the piano, the altar's open this morning. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? If you have a need of some sort, God is still the answer. Why don't you come? If you're here this morning and need to be saved, would you come and let me take the Bible and show you how you can be saved? Would you do it? You young people, there might come a day when you would give anything to be able to come back to this Sunday morning and commit your life to God. That day may come. There's moms and dads at the altar this morning. There's young people at the altar this morning. What's keeping you at your seat? What's keeping you? Page 476 in your hymn book. The song is, You're All on the Altar of Sacrifice Laid. We're going to sing it together. Page 476, this altar's open. Don't let the hymn book keep you in your pew this morning. Let's sing together on the first verse, page 476. You have longed for sweet peace 
and for faith to increase and have earnestly fervently prayed but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid your heart does the spirit control you can all And have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. All right, we're going to sing that second verse. If nobody comes, we're going to close the service. So you come as we sing. If you are an usher to help take up the offering earlier, would you quietly slip to the back and get ready to receive an offering at this time as we sing that second verse together? Would you walk with the Lord? in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always you must do his sweet will to be free from all ill on the altar your own Is your role on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body. Right, just remain standing. Come on, man, with those offering plates. Let's get our offering this morning for Brother Steve. I was just telling him it's so sad to me the way the world has bought in. I'm sorry, how the church has bought into the to the lives of the world. The world tells us that those lines drawn for us by God are they're, they're bondage. They're just they're just uh, they're just bondage, and they, boy, they don't know the, the liberty there is in Christ Jesus. Those lines certainly have fallen in pleasant places. I'm telling you, I'll take those lines any day. All right, all that comes in right now goes right to Brother Steve. So let's take care of him this week. He's given up a Sunday at his church to be with us. I know what a sacrifice that is. I really do. We appreciate that very much. And um, I promise you that his church misses him when he's not there just as much as y'all say you miss me when I'm not here. Uh, I promise you that, that. He's got a wonderful, wonderful church. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm honored that he would, he'd be here on a Sunday with us. Father, thank you for the message this morning. God, thank you for the conviction. Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering. Would you let it be a help and a blessing to Brother Steve and his family and his ministry. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.